This week we're looking at China again, um, reform and reaction. So where we left off with China was with Mao. We talked a lot about um, Mao's cultural revolution and his sort of five-year plan and how it failed ultimately. So the f objectives we're looking at this week, summarize Mao's rule, uh, explain the changes under Xiaoping, describe the democracy movement, and also discuss the relationship between economic and political change in China. So we're going to be looking at China from around the 70s to more current. So looking back at Mao, this is Mao right here. I'm sure you guys all recognize him. So Mao Zedong, he, his whole idea was to improve China's economy. But many of the plans that Mao comes up with is they fail. Okay, So if we were to think back to when we were learning about Mao, we're discussing his first five-year plan, which was a failure, his great leap forward, which was also a failure, along with the Cultural Revolution. What I want you to do for your first question, please summarize those three things just to sort of remind you what exactly Mao was trying to do with economy in China. Mao's policies, they often lacked modern technology. So he is sort of using, um, China has not industrialized along with many of its counterparts, such as the Soviet Union. And that is the main reason why it prevents from growing economically. So after he launches the Cultural Revolution in the 60s, we sort of have a revived communist spirit. But again, the Cultural Revolution ends up with mil millions of people dying and a lot of lost historical artifacts. Um, its excesses turn many people against communism. So basically, a result of the Cultural Revolution and the Red Army was that many people in China are starting to not like communism. After Mao dies, we have Xiao Enlai. He ends up being the leader in the early 70s. And he tries to sort of pursue more moderate policies. So whereas Mao has sort of a more extreme way, version of communism, Xia and Lai, he's trying to moderate some of these uh, economic policies. Xiao, he is also worried that China is isolated from the rest of the world. So we discussed how Mao and Stalin end up sort of falling out. They, and um, the Soviet Union does not necessarily support China's type of communism. Well, Xiao and Lai, he's worried that now China is too isolated and doesn't have much trade going on with the rest of the world, which is affecting China from growing as an economic power. So in 1971, we start to see the U.S. and China beginning to have a closer relationship. Now this is still during the Cold War. In 1971, we have Richard Nixon is in office, and if you remember Nixon's policy, he had the detente day policy, which was trying to sort of have a more moderate view in the Cold War. So Nixon was not completely opposed to actually working with another communist country, just like Xiao Enlai. We, in 1967, we start to see um, some economic reform. So both Mao and Xiao have died, and more moderates end up taking control of the Communist Party. So the next sort of major leader that rises up in China is Deng Xiaoping. And he is the major leader in China in the 1980s. Now Xiaoping, who is pictured right here, he is still a part of this like sort of old communist revolutionaries. But what he does start to do with um, is reform a lot of what Mao was doing. So one thing that he does is he wants to, is called the Four Modernizations. So he is trying to make progress for both agriculture, industry, defense, science, and technology. So all of these things he wants to improve in China. Now, the way that he improves um, agriculture in China is he gets rid of Mao's communes. Now, if you remember, communes was that sort of shared land that people were, lived in dorms and worked together. This was not efficient. So what um, Xiaoping does is he actually leases out the lands to individual farmers 
and those farmers had to give a certain amount of food to the government. This actually sparked a growth up to 50% in, in um, six years of food production. So this was a, a very good sort of modernization and reform that Xiaoping did. The way that Xiaoping sort of tries to modernize industry in China is he's actually using some capitalist ideals. So he is not afraid necessarily to use some capitalism in communism. And he actually welcomes more foreign investment in China. This leads to a huge growth in the industry in China as well. So we have sort of a spark with more technology being produced in China. We also, it sort of affects people's um, personal lives as well. So people are actually allowed to have an income instead of just living um, off the land and sharing. They actually have some money of their own. So you start to see a rise of Western music and youth are able to dress in more fashionable clothes. We also start to see that families are owning things like television sets. So there is the except opening up of some capitalism in Chinese communism is sort of sparks a lot of growth. We do see a problem that arises with some capitalism entering into um, this sort of communist country. And that is, leads to a massacre in Tiananmen Square. So with more, um, with more privileges being given to people in China, we have a widening gap of poor and rich. So we have extreme poverty. And the people who are getting rich are the people who are connected to the communist leaders. So they're communist leaders themselves, or they're somehow connected to the government. Um, this also enters in sort of more Western political ideas. So many students are now sort of learning more about what it means to have a democratic country. And in 1989, we have a huge student protest in Tiananmen Square. Now, if you guys don't know what Tiananmen Square is, it is a huge um, open area where the Forbidden Palace is in Beijing. And what ends up happening is many students, it starts with about 100,000 students, and it ends up multiplying to become this huge protest. At one point during this protest, they erect a huge statue, and they call it the Goddess of Democracy. Now, this is saying something very strong to the Chinese Communist government. What in, and many people, many of these students were um, asking um, Xiao Ping to or Deng to step out. He, they're saying we it is time that China became a democracy. Now instead, Deng sort of orders a huge crackdown. So the army surrounds Tiananmen Square, and he, we call this martial law. So this is a large military crackdown, and it ends up um, having a standoff between the students and uh, the army. And what ends up happening is the army ends up attacking these students who are mostly unarmed, and it's leaving hundreds dead and thousands of people wounded. So this marks um, sort of a, a major point in Chinese history, where at one point Chinese, the Chinese were demanding democracy. And as a response, the government sort of snuffs out any protest amongst the country. So there's a huge campaign that is trying to stop what happened in uh, 1989. Now, they were also trying to stop the news from, um, in the world from hearing about the protest, but it was too late. Pretty much the whole world was a witness to what happened at Tiananmen Square. Your second question is, I want you to imagine if the Tiananmen Square protest had been successful and Deng had stepped down, how do you think China would be today? And if it was successful, would this have affected Taiwan differently as well? Uh, in 1997, we have Deng is, has died, and we have a new leader, Jiang. He ends up taking power. Now, uh, even though Deng dies in this year, he's already sort of stepped out of power and let Jiang sort of take the reins. Now, many people wanted um, Jiang to move away from what Deng was doing with his reforms, his economic reforms. Um, and Jiang doesn't change that much. He's a highly educated man. This is him right here, okay? And he does try to sort of open up more positive relations, 
positive relationships with the U.S., but of course, there's a lot of backlash in the U.S. They want more democracy in China, and Jiang is still not really open to having、um, some democracy in China. Okay, in 2002, Jiang ends up stepping down, and we have another guy stepping up, Zhu Ranji. I'm sorry if I'm saying it wrong. So both Jiang and Zhu Zhu. Favor they both favor the continued reforms of what Deng did. So these sort of more strict reforms. That being said, in China there's going to be a lot of tension because there's economic、um, opening with、uh, more capitalism coming into China, but、uh, politically it is still very much communist. And of course there's going to be a lot of tension between those two ideas. Capitalism is opening up. People are starting to make money. They're starting to be highly educated, and of course, with education comes the want for democracy, and that's still happening today. In 1997, we have Hong Kong, which was、um, formerly a British colony.、Um, it enters back into China. So we have the city of China. It is a major economic power in the world. I'm sure many of you have actually been to Hong Kong. So in 1997, British hands it back over to Hong Kong, and this marks sort of a huge event in China as well. Now, looking at China to more today, be, it says China beyond 2000.、Um, the economic reforms that、uh, Deng and Jiang have continued it has reduced overall poverty in China. So we do have people are starting to be able to work more. And starting to have a livelihood,、uh, many countries have economic problems, and China's economy it's growing today, and that is something that we all know. This is something that is constantly in the media. In fact, since the 2000s, China is the fourth economy in the world, and that is rising every year. Many people actually believe that China is going to be the largest economic power in the world within a decade. That is ten years. So we're seeing the decline of the American economy and the rise of the Chinese economy.、Uh, many in China want political reform, so there is a want for some more democracy and some more opening of the government.、Uh, China is also becoming way more involved with other countries. Uh, within the last few years, we're starting to see China heavily involved in Africa. China is also heavily involved in America.、Um, many businesses that were American have now moved to China. So this is sort of why I'm picturing these down here. We, we're, this is what we think of when we think of modern day China. We think of factories. We think of people working in factories, and we think of well, sad to say, pollution. So what I want you to do is I want you to think back to the Industrial Revolution in the mid 1800s, and I want you to compare it to what China is going through now. So how is what Britain and America and Europe went through the 1800s? How is that similar to what China is doing right now?